So guys, I have a lesson for us, a lesson for us all, not just myself, not just all of you, but the media in general as a whole in its absolute failure to do basic research on this case. And that, and that goes to me too. I, I'm not exempting myself from doing the big stupid here, but I'll, I'll explain. Now I had been checking in on Pacer with this case, you know, about every week, maybe a couple times a week just to make sure I wasn't missing anything by accident. And I noticed something very curious about this lawsuit. Usually, rather quickly, the lawyers on the plaintiff side get around to, you know, serving the defendants. That basic first step to begin this lawsuit, well, after, you know, filing. It's the second thing you do. You have to give notice to the other party so that they can respond to your lawsuit. A court's not just going to say, yeah, it sounds like a great story. We're going to go and punish someone else without hearing their side of the argument. Well, everything was filed on the 13th of last month. It's been almost four weeks now. In fact, next week, it will have been a whole 30 days since this lawsuit was filed. And there's nothing, no service, nothing going on. I'm starting to wonder what's going on here. Like, it's it's normal for pro se litigants to struggle with service, but these are supposedly real lawyers in the state of New York. In fact, who are these lawyers? What's going on here? I, I, just, I had to know, so I started looking. So the first slight red flag is that both of these lawyers are personal practice lawyers with no digital footprint, no business address. In fact, one uses a P.O. box and the other uses a personal residence address. They have no offices, they have no nothing, no staff, and you're going to tell me that these are legitimate corporate lawyers or securities lawyers without a staff, legal or otherwise, other people in the practice to help them deal with the caseload? Okay, I mean, sure, I guess that is possible, but it does not sound particularly practical to me. And then I realized I have Pacer, and everything just started falling into place and falling apart for plaintiffs as to the legitimacy of their lawsuit. So I took the two corporate cases from Miriam Tabor's Law 360, and what did I find? I found in both of those cases that after failing to properly service the defendants, they then tried to ask for a waiver of service, which in an alternative means rather than personally handing the papers to the person or mailing them, you know, emailing them or whatever. After even failing to do that, both of them were voluntarily dismissed. And in the case of both of them, hey, look, it's our friend David Lopez. Now, now, come on. There's, they, They've done three cases together in the past three years, two of them in 2020, and both the ones in 2020 that I've researched so far ended in voluntary dismissal. This just seems a little bit weird. Well, let's, let's dig a little further since... I have Pacer, I can search by the lawyer, because if they're a lawyer attached to the case, it doesn't matter who they're representing, I can find all their cases in the state of New York. So why don't we just do that? Every federal case that has th their names attached to it in Pacer. Let's go find them. First up is Deborah Tabor, and she has at least two pages of this on Pacer. All of them with many of the same plaintiffs making around the same charges against a various slew of different companies and businesses, whether it be Rubenstein or Donahue or whoever, and almost always it's a pair of her and our good friend David Lopez. He's starting to get a picture here, it's starting to come into clear view what this AMC Antara lawsuit really is. David Lopez has 10 pages of the same crap. Now, given there's some actual real lawsuits in there, some of them that are still pending, but the vast majority of them have, the again, the same plaintiffs, Donahue and Rubenstein, and include uh, Miss Tabor. I can't even believe that I didn't think to do this, this sort of research at the beginning. It was so simple. It was so right there in your face if you bothered to look. But in all fairness, neither did Bloomberg. No one else did this. No one else checked this. The only reason it ever came up to be in front of the community at large, the investment community at large, is because I had a little brain worm in the back of my head that said, 
hmm, they're really taking a long time to come around and serve the defendants. What the heck's going on here, guys? Otherwise, no one would ever know. No one would ever know. So, in short, in conclusion of this pretty short video, this lawsuit can be safely filed away in the bullshit folder, the round file, the trash, the garbage bin, because it's just a fishing game. It's a frivolous lawsuit meant to try and scare... Well, I, I don't even know if it's even designed to do that, because half the time, they don't even properly serve the defendants. It's... I don't know what it is other than someone thinks it's a laugh and a half to, you know, set money on fire doing lawsuits that go nowhere. So, um, yeah, that's really disappointing. But uh, I guess that's over with. Uh, I really thought this uh, lawsuit was going to be interesting, but uh, no, not so much. Oh, well. If anything changes, I'll, I'll let you know, but... I have a I have a pretty good feeling that this is the last we'll need to hear of Mr. Donahue's lawsuit against Antara. Till next time, I'll catch you guys later.